Solar Ash was easily one of my most anticipated games of the year. That may seem odd to most of you who I assume haven't heard about it until reading the title of this video, which means that I'm probably going to have to explain the game's history first. A while back I did a video on a game called Hyperlight Drifter, developed by a microscopic indie team called Heart Machine. Hyperlight Drifter is, in my opinion, the single greatest example of video games as an art form. Primarily because of the personal story of Heart Machine's lead developer, Alex Preston. To make a long story very short, Alex Preston has a heart condition that hospitalizes him regularly and can potentially kill him just sort of whenever. Hyperlight Drifter, as a game, acted as a metaphor for Alex's thoughts and anxieties surrounding this problem, and as a result, is a direct reflection of one man's existential grappling with reality in a way that no other game I'm aware of really seems to be. If you want more details, I would suggest watching both the rest of this video and my old video on Hyperlight Drifter itself. Knowing all of this, I went into Solar Ash, Heart Machine's second game, expecting that same unique existential perspective and I definitely was not disappointed. Solar Ash is a game that tries to tackle a lot of complex topics, like the eternal cycle of life and death that drives all life in the universe. Coming to terms with accepting that all things are temporary, even your own existence, and accepting the fact that despite how large your ego may be, your own death will likely not be of any major importance. But before we get bogged down with this sort of incredibly heavy analysis, let's just talk straight game design. Solar Ash is a heavily movement-based exploration platformer. The main character, Ray, has a variety of fast movement options that allow you to grind, jump, and skate your way through the world's movement puzzles, which will eventually culminate in a movement boss. The core loop is simple. Skate around the open world solving puzzles, once enough puzzles are solved, you unlock the area's boss, you beat the boss, and go on to the next area. Of course, putting Solar Ash's movement system on paper is one thing, but executing it is another entirely. Fortunately, Heart Machine has executed on this pretty much flawlessly. The physics of jumping, skating, and grappling all feel essentially perfect and allow for some extremely satisfying platforming and platforming combat sections. I'm pretty sure these boss fights are the best example of platforming combat or platforming bosses that have ever been put in a game. These bosses also massively increase in complexity and difficulty if you're playing the game on one of the harder difficulties. I streamed some gameplay of hardcore mode, and it is absolutely insane. But once you get into the flow of things on these harder difficulties, it can almost feel like a rhythm game, which is just pretty good. Like you would probably expect from the team who created Hyperlight Drifter, Solar Ash also has its fair share of secrets and extras to unlock. These come in two varieties. Pieces of storylines of certain characters that are unlocked by finding them and following their hints and side quests, and these Void Runner caches that unlock more story information and different suits for Rey, which have different passive abilities. For the overwhelming majority of the game, there is no real way to track any of this stuff the way that you can scan for the various platforming puzzles, so finding all of these requires you to be observant and explore every corner of the world in detail. It isn't nearly as packed full of secrets as Hyperlight Drifter, which is one of my only gripes about the game, but in the grand scheme of things, this doesn't really matter. The exploration is done well, and the movement system is fun enough to justify the time you need to spend searching out everything. Surprisingly, Solar Ash also has a fully voiced story and plot, the complete opposite of Hyperlight Drifter, which told its entire story without even using text. All of the voice actors do a great job, and there are never any points where bad voice acting becomes a distraction. That being said, I can't help but feel like Solar Ash could have benefited from the surreal wordlessness of Hyperlight. But, on the other hand, in a lot of ways, Solar Ash is trying to tell a significantly more complex story and portray significantly more complex metaphors, so developing it 
as a purely visual medium probably would have been completely and needlessly complicated and obtuse. Just on a surface level, Solar Ash is a great game. The movement is perfect, the story is interesting, the game's world and art style are all incredible. It's just about as watertight as a game can get, especially a game from a team this small. It is a bit short coming in at around 8 to 10 hours to finish completely, but it absolutely justifies a second playthrough on the hardest difficulty you can manage. And in a world where AAA developer employees are stealing breast milk from each other, trying to make an NFT game with some sort of devil's trick, and putting Naruto in Fortnite, why not support an indie dev who, at the time of my writing this, has yet to commit any breast milk related crime? And don't even get me started on this shit. But to give a review of Solar Ash this shallow would be a disservice to the game's deeper messaging and a disservice to Alex Preston as an artist. So now it's time to get really high and think about what happens when you die. In order to really explain Solar Ash's major themes, I'm going to need to lay out the basics of its story and cover the game's entire plot in full. Obviously that means that from this point forward, spoilers are going to come fast and hard without any warning. Solar Ash has a lot of metaphorical and spiritual angles to it, but the first thing we need to do is establish the baseline story. This part is going to be a little dry, but the information dump is kind of required to put everything into context, especially for the weird freaks that are going to watch the rest of this video without playing the game. The game takes place inside the Ultra Void, which is a massive black hole. Of course, this is a fantasy black hole and not a science black hole, so instead of getting atomized by the event horizon, we get to roller skate around on clouds and gravity just sort of does funny pranks instead of killing you instantly. The problem is, our main character's planet up here is stuck in the orbit of the Ultra Void, which means it's going to be destroyed eventually. Ray is the last standing member of a group of people called Void Runners who are specially equipped and trained to travel through black holes and have planted this big Evangelion spear in the Ultra Void called the Star Seed. The Star Seed is designed to do some unexplained science magic in hopes that this will make the Ultra Void evaporate before the home planet is destroyed. Unfortunately, everyone on the team is missing, and this AI that needs to activate the Star Seed is offline, so Ray needs to roll around at the speed of sound to destroy all the Void anomalies that are causing interference and get the AI back online, which will allow her to activate the Star Seed and destroy the Black Hole. Your first hint that this isn't the game's real plot comes after beating the first tutorial boss and meeting this character. The large spear that looks exactly like the one going through the Ultra Void sticking out of her chest isn't a coincidence. It's probably also not a coincidence that it's stuck directly in her heart. You know, like a metaphor for a heart condition or something. I don't know. I'm not a writer. This character is referred to as Echo, and the farther you get into the game, the more cryptic and menacing she becomes. A light in your eyes. Insufferable. I wish I could snuff it out. As you move through the different areas of the Void, if you take the time to complete all of the story arc side missions and find all of the Void Runner caches scattered throughout the world, you will start to uncover more of what is actually going on from the game's various other characters. For the purposes of this analysis, the three most important characters apart from Rey and Echo are the Void Runners Tufty and Pyatt and this raccoon lady Lyris. Lyris is the first character you meet that is another living being trapped in the void with you. Her story, in and of itself, is not very complicated. Her home world was invaded by a hostile alien force, her and her husband joined the resistance, he dies, and she lives, and at some point during all of this, their planet is sucked into the Ultra Void. The real important reveal during this plot thread is that Lyris's memory seems to be getting erased and she has lived through discovering her husband is gone and 
finding his grave an unknown number of times, stuck in some kind of memory cycle of loss and grief over and over again. Pyatt is the next character you meet towards the last act of the game when the plot really starts coming together. He is portrayed as a very spiritual and religious fanatic. He becomes obsessed with studying the Void and obsessed with the Starseed, and comes to the conclusion that the Void shouldn't be destroyed, but instead, power to the Starseed should be overloaded, causing it to, for some reason, restart the universe and transcend into something new. His insane plot is one of the key reasons why the mission falls apart in the first place. Finally, the last Void Runner you come across in the final part of the game is Tufty. Tufty is a genius mathematician that runs the numbers over and over and essentially comes to the conclusion that the Void Runners were too late, their planet is doomed, and activating the Star Seed will not help. Additionally, she also theorizes that overloading the Star Seed the way Pyatt is demanding could cause a catastrophic space time event which will just obliterate the entire universe rather than actually achieving anything. If you've ever seen a video game, now you are probably rightly assuming that the responsibility now falls on the player to make a decision. Do we gamble activating the Star Seed on faith and the off chance it might somehow fix the situation, or do we simply accept our fate and let our planet die? Sid, the AI from earlier, also informs us, based on her calculations, that it's possible that the Star Seed could reverse time, giving Rey a second chance at saving the homeworld. If you're paying attention, you probably already see where this is going. In the game's final showdown, Rey climbs to the top of the Star Seed to activate it, and is confronted by Echo, who appears and finally reveals that Rey needs to leave the Star Seed turned off and accept her fate, and that activating the Star Seed does not send her back in time, but really just reverses time to a point in the past for everything to happen exactly the same over and over again. This is why Lyris is stuck in a memory loop, and this is why Echo remembers and hates Rey for constantly starting the time loop over and over again countless times and forcing her to suffer infinitely. If you choose to restart the Star Seed, you will loop back to the beginning of the game, and if you choose to keep the Star Seed deactivated, Rey will become a remnant and Echo will be given back her true form. Rey is then defeated, and the two of them merge back together into one being, ending the cycle. There is a lot going on here. These metaphors of an eternal cycle and a struggle between some force that wants to break the cycle and some force that wants to perpetuate the cycle are all components of various types of spiritual and metaphysical ideas that have been circulating in the public consciousness for literally thousands of years. If you lean more towards a Buddhist-style thought process, Ray represents the ego that wants to continue existence, refusing to give up on material life, only to be constantly reincarnated, while Echo represents the nirvana of transcending this and reaching enlightenment, escaping the cycle of reincarnation, and becoming one with the idea of being nothing. If you're like me and tend to take a more Gnostic interpretation, Echo represents the divine spark or the soul desperate to return to the god mind, while Rey represents the material mind trapped in the prison of the Demiurge. These contradictory character pairings that represent some sort of metaphysical duality are really the core of Solar Ash. For example, in the pairing of Tufty and Pyatt, Pyatt is the ego and Tufty is the opposing force. And this pairing is interesting because it actually inverts how we commonly think of these two ideas. Pyatt is portrayed as being a deeply spiritual and religious man, the type of person that we typically associate with being okay with the idea of dying and moving on, while Tufty is portrayed as being a very material scientist who are the people we usually associate with holding on to the material world in a way that is obnoxious. This inversion is fun because it proves that there are ways to arrive at sound spiritual beliefs via science and also proves that sometimes being religious and spiritual 
just means you have a giant fucking ego. There are probably hundreds of different ways that all of this could be interpreted, and hundreds of different subtle strategies that different esoteric orders and Eastern philosophies have used to grapple with these same ideas, but it's always more or less the same. You will die someday, and that's fine. You better get over it now and stop wasting all your time freaking out about the material world. Even the big man himself was saying this shit. And, in fact, dying might not even be bad. It might be the start of something new. You don't know. You've never done it. And besides, this whole thing is probably just some kind of endless cycle where you live countless lives over and over again anyway. However, while I think Solar Ash was probably borrowing something from all of these different branches of esoteric mysticism, I think one of the primary inspirations was a little bit more interesting. And now it's time to talk about the mushrooms. About halfway through the game, it becomes clear that mushrooms are an enormous part of both the story themes and the world building of Solar Ash. From a world building perspective, these mushrooms, and this race of mushroom people called the Umbra, are the only life you meet that are actually native to the Ultra Void. They grow by feeding on all the decaying matter that is on the planets pulled into the void over time. After dying, the mushroom people are absorbed back into the fungal network of the mushrooms and become one with all the other mushroom people who lived before them. And this conscious mushroom matrix can be contacted by talking to one of the mushroom elders. Arik, the currently last living mushroom man, even has a choice that mirrors Ray's. He is responsible for dying and bringing the new Mushroom Keeper into being, but he's too scared to complete the ritual and merge with the hive mind. Once again, we see someone who is too afraid to just let go of their ego. And also, if you're paying attention, Arik and the Elders are another one of those contradictory character pairings. What is significantly more interesting than all of this internal world building, though, is the real world science and philosophy that inspires it, which goes on to prop up the rest of the game's theming. The archetypal mushroom mind, or the fungal network, is actually a relatively new idea in pop culture. It comes from the discovery of massive mycelial networks, both in tropical and temperate rainforests, and some other places, that essentially form enormous underground networks of complex chemical communication between various fungal and plant species. In a sense, this proved that old pagan idea that all nature is connected was even more literal than we initially thought. Given all of this, it's easy to see how, just based on this fun bit of mushroom biology, a game like Solar Ash would pick the mushroom to be the symbol for its central theming around the relationships between life and death. Fungi are decomposers, they thrive off dead stuff, and sometimes literally fruit out of their dead bodies. They are one of the best symbols we have of life after death, natural cycles, oneness, and coming to terms with the fact that not only are you mortal, but you are required to be mortal for this whole fucking show to keep running. And I could talk about all of this stuff for hours, but let's be honest, there is one very specific type of mushroom you're all waiting for me to bring up. be insane for me to sit here and tell you about the cultural impact and symbolism of mushrooms without bringing up arguably the most culturally relevant mushroom of our time, the psychoactive psilocybin mushroom. We are in the middle of a psychedelic revolution right now. 
Using substances like the funny mushrooms and LSD haven't been as widespread as they are now in the sort of white western culture of the Anglosphere since probably the 60s or 70s. Based on this, I don't think it's a stretch that Solar Ash pulled an enormous amount of its inspiration from not only the mythology and lore of this particular type of mushroom, but also, more than likely, their use. Let's go back for a second and look at the major themes of Solar Ash. Understanding that everything is interconnected. Understanding the importance of cycles on both the level of life on Earth and the level of the cosmic. Coming to terms with loss and death and fully realizing your own mortality. Letting go of your ego and realizing you probably aren't that important as an individual and should instead turn towards your greater place in the grander community. All of this and more is perfectly reflected in the cultural memes about psychedelic drugs, especially mushrooms. And it's important to understand, it isn't just annoying new-aged hippies and folk punk bands living in converted buses talking about this kind of stuff. Psilocybin mushrooms exist basically on every continent on Earth and have been used in religious practices likely for thousands of years, one of the most famous being the mushroom cults of Mexico. And, just in case the ancient knowledge isn't good enough for you, in recent times a lot of scientific research has been done on using these mushrooms for treating depression and anxiety and for all different sorts of therapies. People who experience using psilocybin in these studies typically report a feeling of interconnectedness, a loss of the fear of death, a relief from depression and anxiety, and even profound spiritual experiences that change their lives forever if the dose is high enough. Maybe most notably for our purposes here, there have been studies that involve using psilocybin to ease the death anxiety of people with terminal illnesses. The type of anxiety I would assume someone in Alex Preston's situation has at some point experienced. At this point in the video, to be fair, I should say that a lot of what I have just laid out is common in what I referred to earlier as sort of the mythology of mushrooms and other psychedelics. If you do any research, or if you consume any art inspired by mushrooms, like, for example, this very rare, almost unheard of science fiction novel, you will know about all of this stuff. You will know about the hippie bullshit of becoming one with your fellow man because the fungus said so, and you will know all about the religious practices that surround them. But I think there is at least one smoking gun here that backs up my claim that Solar Ash was also partially inspired by the literal use of mushrooms, and that is this. It's probably going to take you a second to see it because it's very subtle, but do you see how these mushrooms are animated to move and grow and shift very, very slowly in a fashion that almost looks like breathing? This is exactly how objects look when you're under the effects of psilocybin. Something that I of course would not recommend that anybody do unless they are of age and live in an area where they are decriminalized or legal. Nice try, YouTube. Also, I mean, the first time we meet Arik, he literally says he is communing while floating around talking to the mushroom mind, something that every shaman who has ever drank some goofy shit in the jungle and screamed on the floor for three hours will also tell you they are doing. Even here in the West, the thing Catholics do is called communion, and they eat a little thing. Where do you think they got that idea? Surely, it couldn't have possibly derived from the thousands of years of old practices of picking up a little thing off the ground, eating it, and seeing God. But anyway, I'm getting completely off the rails here. What the fuck was the point of this whole mushroom rant? I don't know. I find it interesting, and this is my YouTube channel, so I can waste your time with whatever I want to. The point is, Solar Ash, much like Hyperlight Drifter which came before it, is a very deep game trying to tackle very deep themes surrounding death and what the fuck the point of any of this even is. All of us know that we will be dead someday, but Alex Preston wakes up every day with the Grim Reaper standing in his bedroom tapping a watch. Alex is in a unique position 
to really consider this stuff in a way that most people simply can't or won't until they are on their deathbed, and that's assuming they're even lucky enough to have a brain that still works. But the best part of all of this is the message of Solar Ash is a relatively hopeful one. This is what the game has to say after Rey's home planet is destroyed. You've managed to end the cycle. Time moves on. The Ultra Void is stable now. But there's so much work to be done. So much to rebuild. Our heart aches for the loss of those we all care for. And the home none of us can return to. But what's left here is not without potential. This could be a place to start something new. Are you all right, Ray? I will be. Ray's planet has to die, and that sucks. But maybe death actually doesn't suck that bad. Maybe it's the start of something new. And even if it isn't, something new might pop out of your skull like this, and that would be pretty metal. And finally, Maybe the most interesting part of Solar Ash is that it might actually be telling us where this message of hope is coming from. Elders who dream in crepuscular infinity, part the eternal veil and enlighten me. If you want any more information on the wild mushroom shit I talked about in this video, Fantastic Fungi is a great documentary. And if you want to see more videos like this one, consider subscribing. A like and a comment also really help out. And if you want more ways to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash probablyjacob where you can subscribe for as little as $2 a month for exclusive podcast content. Speaking of which, I also run a podcast called Inherently Optimistic that you can find pretty much anywhere podcasts are. And down in the description, you can find a link to my Twitch channel where I stream sometimes and my Discord channel, where my community posts things that should be illegal. And finally, you should follow me on Twitter so you don't miss any important updates. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.